when and why did you become interested in Antarctica? I read in the uh, Wikipedia that your parents already had some enthusiasm in uh, the poles. No, not really. Uh, that's a wrong uh, thing, I think. But my, my parents were outdoors people. Okay. So, um, so and we, um, we spent, you know, the holidays in the mountain skiing. And uh, I live in the outskirts of Oslo. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a lot of nature. But the the start was, um, well, the first dream I can remember when I was a kid was after my dad took me to the documentary of the Thor Heidel, the Kotiki expedition. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, so I started to dream about that. But then we went to Denmark on a holiday and I got seasick because the mm -hmm. first my first dream, I was six years old, was that I wanted to um, sail on all oceans to meet kids with different color you know it has nothing to do with the Antiki. yeah so when i saw that the that documentary in the fifth grade i was thinking oh my god what's so many strange things that's going working on in kids heads but yeah. um my father was a contractor and, and he did some work on um, nonsense uh, home uh outside oslo Yeah. And my brother and I, we were, we were allowed to sit by Fleet of Lance, the first man that uh, crossed the Greenland mm -hmm. ice cap, mm -hmm. uh, a scientist and the first mm -hmm. ambassador to Norway in London. Well, he's, an, he's one of our national heroes. So, and I, I mean, he was the first man that crossed the uh, Greenland ice cap as well. Mm -hmm. So I went home and started to read about that expedition. Yeah. But you know, at that, 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 that time I was eight years old, then he was not really, it was two long sentences, I think. So I went to school the day after and asked if they had a kid's book about uh, Nansen. Mm -hmm. They did not, but they have a book uh, for youth that, that was called Skiing to the South Pole by Roel Amundsen. Mm -hmm. And that was the start yeah. when I read that. Yeah. And I had loved skiing since I get got my first skis when I was three years old, so um, so I was really hooked. And uh, I think I think my parents nursed in a way, especially because my father I remember drove me to Amundsen's home, mm -hmm. um, close to a little bit south of the here from the in the Oslo Fjord. Yeah. But uh, in the beginning, I really, my main goal was to become an Olympic skier in cross country. Okay. But then I injured myself and uh, had a back problem and I was taken by avalanche and blah, blah, blah. So, so uh, then I started to coach. And, but I had nursed that I've been reading all these years since I was a kid about uh, North Pole expedition and South Pole expeditions. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when I was a teacher, I, I become a high school teacher uh, in literature, history, and sport. And uh, in the summertime, I spent one month uh, guiding on Svalbard, Spitsbergen, the Norwegian Arctic, mm -hmm. having ski expeditions and hiking there. And then it was come more and more extreme, you know, uh, out of life. And then I was, and I also lived like class. Uh, quite close to a very nice climbing hill here. Mm -hmm. So I was doing different outdoors. Um, and in 1988, it was 100 years since uh, Nansen crossed the Greenland ice cap. It was a lot of expedition of men, of course, that wanted to do the anniversary expedition. Yeah. And I asked to join them. And um, of course, I didn't really want to have a woman on board. So in... Uh, so in 1992, I was the first woman with a friend, Julie Muske, that crossed the Greenland ice, ice cap as women. So that was the start. And I had this dream about the South Pole. And then I really realized that I was capable to do that because the year before I skied solo, it was a Norwegian man that skied solo and unsupported. He was... Uh, I knew I was experiencing glaciers, and uh, um, and I asked Julie, my friend, if she wanted to come with me to the South Pole. But she was more than a, a climber, and she said, "I'm so tired of wide open spaces." And I had also been on expedition that people mentally collapsed when they are not really prepared. And I'm introvert, so I was thinking, "I can, I can do it on my own." And uh, and my family 
this has supported me, my husband, well, my ex-husband, he supported me. And so then and that's why it's, uh, it was a, this was an old dream that come true, actually. It was a long journey, yeah, from, from being a kid interested in, in such things. And then, uh, some, uh, a lot of years later, you did this step. How was it, uh, uh, how was your first impressions arriving in Antarctica? What, what was it? like to from uh, be um, how did it feel like to to come to this um yeah is it a desert of ice or um, how what was the first impression uh, arriving in antarctica of course it's <clears throat> it's a lot of preparation and stress before you go just to sort everything out and when we landed uh we flew from punta arenas mm -hmm. and flew over to the continent and there was a lot of Mountains, so it's not was not this white open plains that it are on inside, but it was yeah, it was sort of a, a I'm really here, it's amazing. I'm 40 years old, I got the dream when I was eight and a half, and uh, so it was really, really unreal. And um, and uh, I think after a week, when I come in, do you, you need to come into a rhythm. Uh, you know, it's, you know, everything, sleep, go to sleep, like you feel like everything is working, your equipment and everything. And I got everything that worked except from my shortwave radio. So I didn't talk to anybody for 50 days mm -hmm. on that expedition. That was before the satellite phones. But I had an Argus transmitter in the bottom of my sled that had pre-coded messages. So my, my family and contacts at home, they knew that I was about skiing 25 kilometers a day and uh, except that uh, the temperature showed 36 plus Celsius. So so when I came home, they wondered, had I been in the Sahara or had I been in Antarctica? But um, so, um, so I had a really good, uh, good, uh, good expedition. And I think that thanks to um, all the years that I had this uh, like a hobby. Yeah, reading about Arctic, yeah, reading about the old expedition, the new expeditions, and also being, uh, you know, being a skier, being on glaciers in Norway, on Svalbard. So I think that's, that was experience that really made that it was such a great trip. You just mentioned, of course, you didn't speak to anybody in this 50 days. Uh, as a psychologist, I asked myself, did you maybe talk to yourself maybe really or maybe mentally so how 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 does a human cope 50 days of being alone well i think i just uh, was um I, I was not of course talking because it's hard work pulling a hundred kilo sled but i was you know sometimes i was talking you know about that was thinking about the, my past the future but sometimes i came into a meditative state Mm -hmm. That uh, I could ski if there, if the snow drifts or if it was not too hard, I come into a meditative state and then I felt sorry I was hungry and I was just thinking oh my goodness I have been skiing for three hours and what did happen to in in my head so mm -hmm. I think it was kind of a meditation sometimes when the weather was um, weather and the surface was sort of was able to 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 move in a in a in a nice way not a struggling you know was it maybe some kind of flow or, or we didn't it have yeah. it's flow i was i'm, I'm using chicks and mahaili in my lectures you know the the mm. that's well, yeah. so i i i feel very i i, I call it flow that's try, right yeah well that's... also and i've also learned something when i was skiing on greenland I'm not sure uh, if it's true, but I read something that um, I got, I get some uh, tunes on my head some music, mm -hmm. you know, when I've been skiing for eight hours or six hours. And I think scientists said that the, the brain is getting bored and you just, at, at, for instance, on the Greenland, I think I got, I want to ride my bicycle or queen. Okay. Uh, and it's really hard to ski in, in that rhythm. And then I talk, I said to you, Julia, that I was skiing with, oh, I'm so tired of that song. I can't get it out of my head. And then she said, well, I also have that as, as a tune that I can get out of my head. And it was that. And that was Lombarda. 
and that right. also went into my head. <laughs> so when I was planning my um, my solo trip, I I could re- realize that that could happen because it's really annoying that you can't get that these silly tunes out of your head. So as a as a, um as a, a teacher in literature, I brought poetry. Okay. So I so I read some poetry uh, every night. Yeah. And well, a th- uh, an idea or a thought that I really wanted to get rid of came into my head. I was thinking, forced myself to think about what I'd been reading the night before, mm-hmm. and then you get then you get some other ideas and thoughts in your head. So that that was really great and it was another thing that I um, uh, in the beginning I thought it was pretty flat there but the, the, I had pretty high sastrugis do you know what that or snow drifts so mm. the, the the surface is not flat it's like a frozen ocean yeah yeah and 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 um, especially in the beginning my sled was heavy 100 kilos and that then I managed to get get that sled over the top it took speed because I dragged my sled in a rope because mm-hmm. then it's easier to get, go back and have some to drink and eat. And it hit my leg, of course. And mm-hmm. I get so irritated and angry at the snow drifts and the sled. And uh, I think that I think I had to read in my journey, but I think it was after five days. So I was so, I was so tired and I was lay, laying in the sleeping, my thinking. I'm not really tired of being here or skiing, but I'm tired of being angry. I can't be angry, you know, when I'm sort of fulfilling my life long dream. So I was thinking, and and um, then I decided that the day after I should um, imagine that I skied in a gallery in modern art because it's so many shapes in the snow, and that. And in addition to that, I read poetry, also made that I had so much going on in my head when, when I even other things that was annoying or I get into a think or an idea or something I didn't, didn't want to spend time on. So, so I, I I could feel my energy really increase after that decision when I was really focusing on the snow drifts and and the artwork of nature. Sounds a bit uh, surreal, aerial. The the impressions that you get from some point on talking about literature, talking about modern art. So it it's, it sounds to me like some kind of um, perception of reality which was very special. Yeah, and it's you know sometimes I didn't do it because the many, many days I didn't have to you know force myself here and there, but but I really it was especially by the the surface uh, because many think that the days are very alike, like that the colors are the same, but it's so many different of blue and white and gray, and so I also got got more and more aware of that that. Uh, that that you know, I'm not. Well, I was not. It, it, every day was kind of different. Mm. So I noticed that more and more, and um, and it it and it's as it's and it was really windy. And one day, I think, yeah, maybe some weeks out in the in the expedition, I had got this feeling that I had to stop. And I was thinking there was no skies, and you know, didn't look like it was coming a storm or something. So the skies were very quiet, uh, or this just still on the on the on the sky. But suddenly, I was in the middle of a blizzard, so I really had to work to pitch my tent. And um, so I was thinking, you know, I got this feeling. What? Why did I get that feeling? And then it happened two or two two weeks later. I got this feeling, and I was like, "Okay, I'll pitch the tent." And the blizzard came, the storm came, and um, I told this story to the scientists when I had a lecture when I arrived at Paul, and they said, "Yes, of course, you felt that you felt the low pressure." Okay. Because mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you have a grand grandmother or 
father that said, oh, I could feel, you know, that it, the bad weather is going bad or something. And mm-hmm. then actually, I think we lose this abilities to, you know, to listen to nature when we are living in a city. So it makes sense. Mm-hmm. It was probably mm-hmm. because I could feel that something told me something. Did you come across any animals or plants? So, so what, what can I imagine? Or is it all ice and snow and... Uh... Yeah, it's a white desert. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. And, um... and for, of course, in the edge of the continent is beautiful because I have been lecturing and traveling there with kayak and ships and boats. And so it's a fantastic wildlife mm. all over the edge of Antarctica. Mm. It's uh, adventure. It's a uh, well, interesting in the research. Antarctica is larger than the whole of Europe. Uh, yet, if you talk to people, we have normally little awareness of Antarctica. What do you think? Why is it so? Or is it maybe a, a bias I have here in, in Germany and it's another way uh, more up in, in Norway and Scandinavian countries? Because you might maybe have some other connection to this kind of nature. Yeah, I think they have more connection. You can see, you know, how what is happening on Spitsbergen and the Norwegian, Norwegian Arctic. Mm-hmm. You see what's seeing at, at the pole, the uh, North Pole, where the smell thing. And I think we are very aware of what's uh, happening in in Antarctica. Mm-hmm. So um, I think because we are in the Arctic, we are also aware of what's uh, happening in Antarctica, and also because we have this history. Because we have a we, Norway was kind of a poor country, and we have these few heroes. And Amundsen was the first man that reached the South Pole, and I think that also link us to the the continent in a different way. There, there are these theories that for many years and um, centuries, even some yeah Nazi base a uh, base in. Uh, Antarctica prevailed and that people could cope to live for a long, long time in Antarctica. Do you think this is in some way realistic or is this this the this this continent so hostile that uh, it ain't possible to live there for a long time? You know, Ar- Argentina, they're uh, one of their bases. They have families living there year, uh, 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 all the whole year. But I don't think for a long time they had to need supplies and everything. Mm. And I think if it was a trapper or an adventure, you could do, you could stay there, you do fish seals or, you know, get all the food you, you really wanted. But it's dark, it's dark, you know, the three, three months, three, four months a, a year. So you really had to plan what to do. Uh, and in, especially in the winter time, and that is really cold. Mm-hmm. So um, I I don't think that's realistic. No. There's under- maybe maybe in three four hundred years. <laughs> it's not bad. Okay, we have to wait. <laughs> Did Antarctica change you in some way, or was it the the journey or the journey through uh, through Antarctica? What would you say? What because I think in some kind of way it changes someone to go. 50 days alone through such a country, a country or such a continent. I'm not sure if, if it changed me, but um, I think I just realized or figured out what what's, what's important and what's not important and what should I spend my time. And for instance, I started to stop the watch TV before the expedition because I had so much time I was working and getting, you know, funding and everything mm. and and today i don't have a i don't have a television of okay. course i had it max max so i could see but i i don't follow all this netflix and everything this series that people are so looking at i would rather read a book or walk in the uh, you know so I, i'm i think people spend so much time with empty things I would rather sit and talk with some friends or walk and talk. And uh, so, um, so I don't spend much time. Of course, I spend much time before uh, in front of this Mac, yeah. but, um, but not, not at night. I don't, I don't watch television. Was it difficult to come back to uh, 
huge populations of people after this 50 days? No, but I reached I reach the South Pole after 50 days. And you know, the Americans, they are have, they are the, they have no limits what to ask you. And they are sort of their, your best friends after five minutes. <laughs> so they invited me inside with a, a warm the tents that I, but I said I would rather stay in my tent because I had to, I, I reached the South Pole Christmas Eve and the plane that was going to take me back home or oh, back here yeah, to the, to the base, uh, lead t uh, January 10th. Wow. So I, uh, so I, I said, can I help? Can I do something? So I, I was a dishwasher there for, uh, <laughs> two weeks or so. Yeah. And it was really exciting because the, the, there was, um, it was voluntary. So, uh, scientists or people that worked with different things on the base. I, so it was very interesting, but I think we adjust very fast, you know, yeah, you can see in, in Ukraine, I know that mm. uh, people just, you know, okay, the, the, the alarm goes, they go into bed and then they continue their normal life. Mm. Mm. Takes some weeks and then they just continue. So I think we are, as a, most human beings, I think as if we are so quite our health, I think we can adjust really fast to, to new situations. Yeah. Um, I know the answer about to the question, but I have to ask it for the book. Did you come across any, yeah, Nazi remains, anything that was out of this world technology in your 50 days? Sorry, Sorry no. <laughs> I have to ask this. Yeah, yeah. What? No, the only, the only I am really have heard about is the Schwab and Lull and the story behind that. And, but I don't think that was anything else than the search for having oil, you know. <laughs> um, one last topic, you returned to Antarctica about seven years later, uh, together with Anne Bancroft, as I read. Yeah. Why so? Is there some kind of um, attraction you, you felt back to Antarctica or why doing this? Well, when I reached the, the South Pole in 1994, I, I said to myself, nothing is going to beat this. This has been a fantastic journey and an expedition. But I also, when I came back to my students, they, they started to ask, you know, why did you, you're crazy? Why did you do it? Yeah. And I said, I had this dream. I had this dream when I was a kid. And I asked, what, do you remember dreams? And then we started to talk about dreams. And they said, well, we are too old. You know, they were in, in high school. And I said, you're not, you are not, you're not too old. Think about what makes your heart, heart beat a little faster or that mm. you get really excited about. That's something that's important for you. And mm. uh, so I was also actually thinking about that. Then I, the last two, four, three, four weeks, I was thinking, how lucky I am. I'm going, to, I'm fulfilling my childhood dream. Yeah. And I was thinking about the kids, my students, I was sitting there, oh my God, why should we learn this? Mm -hmm. And why should we read this? And so I was thinking, I have just so started to write a management book for young people. And then when I started to talk about that, and they said that we we're discussing, you're too old to this stuff and so and so. And, uh, and I was also thinking young people, you know, 16 and eight, eight years old, they're not reading books about how to, you know, create their own life and so and so. But when I got a letter from Anne Bancroft, she asked me if uh, I wanted to cross the uh, Antarctic continent and use that expedition to market uh, curriculums about uh, how young people can, can uh, find their potential find their dreams and fulfill them. Yeah. And I was, I remember I got a letter and I said, wow, there's a person on the side of the Atlantic that's thinking about the same as me. Mm -hmm. So I would send them, at, yeah, let, tell me more about the, 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 the educational program. And um, so I was thinking, and this is going to be made on the internet. And I was thinking, of course, kids are on the internet. Mm -hmm. So that was the sort of the main motivation about it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I love skiing. I love Antarctica. <laughs> and 
today do you often think back to Antarctica in, in the way that you th uh, think why not doing it for not maybe for this uh, great journey but going back there to to feel Antarctica once again or is the part where you say okay I did this I lived my dream I'm very happy to uh, do so but uh, I finished this chapter of my life well, I'm not going to ski to the South Pole again, but I'm so lucky that I get invited, you know, to um, to uh, trips uh, to the Antarctic Peninsula mm. and see the, the, and see the wildlife and the the beautiful mountains. But I will not not ski to the South Pole. Mm. But I would, I will probably uh, guide a fundraising trip across the Greenland ice cap next mm. year, next May. But that's because uh, I'm, 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 I'm a mentor for some women that have uh, survived breast cancer and mm -hmm. they want to make a fundraising uh, expedition. Mm -hmm. And um, so they have the stories because many young women, they look so healthy, but people are not, you know, understand how, you know, the fatigue and, you know, there are all these other things they have after medicine. So. So there are four women uh, that will uh, do that and tell their stories. So that's so probably do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Liv. I uh, asked you not only I, the thing that I wanted you to ask, but a, uh, maybe a, a bit more. Uh, thanks for this interview. Would it be? You should, you should ask me. Did I ever feel uh, lonely? Did I want to give up, or did I feel uh, yeah. something? Yeah, but you, you told it to me more or less. So the, the question of being lonely, I guess it was answered. I understood you that way that uh, it was a, a change of moods and some sometime you didn't feel as lonely as you feel upset. That's what I understood. There were only the day I felt very lonely when I was halfway and I had a little bottle of drumbees I wanted to celebrate. Mm. And I took a phenyl canister and the trambouille and the alcohol went right to my head. And then, ooh, there was nobody there to celebrate. So that was a, all that time I got really, ooh, I'm, I'm, you know, alcohol is not good for me here. Mm -hmm. So I saved it to the, to the South Pole. But that was the only feeling I felt, hmm, I'm really alone here. Yeah, for thousands of kilometers, no one there. Look, thanks a million. I have to say you're really inspiring. I talk to a lot of people and uh, you have this, um, how to call it in English, um, some kind of friendly light. I don't, I don't know to, to find other words. You, you, you uh, yeah, you, you are very positive and inspiring. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a nice day and thanks again. Uh, you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.